For those that came in, we will be starting in two minutes. I just copied down the focus question and uh, what's in red, and we'll talk in a second. Okay, guys and girls, so let's get started. Um, first off, a little bit of an election update for those that are not aware. It's looking like, still, we still don't know, obviously, and I still don't think we'll know officially until maybe, when I mean officially is we, we really don't have a better idea of um, who wins until the next day or two. And even then, you have to wait for the opponent to uh, concede, which I'm thinking is going to take a while. So right now, I would say it's 75-25 Biden's going to win. Um, that's because he, does, he has more electoral votes right now, but that's not exactly it. The reason is um, the state of Arizona is trending towards maybe Trump can steal it and take it back. But um, things like Georgia, okay, Pennsylvania are kind of trending towards Biden. If Biden wins Georgia or Pennsylvania, it's over. Um, but essentially, uh, we still don't know who the president is. Um, it's probably 75-25. That's the update where we are. I mean, there wasn't really any groundbreaking news yesterday um, in terms of picking up states after 12 o'clock. Uh, we kind of got the sense that Wisconsin and Michigan went to uh, Biden, though it was very, very close. Um, I know Wisconsin's probably gonna have a recount that probably won't make a difference though. Uh, so Wisconsin's most likely gonna say to Biden. Therefore, it's looking like 75-25 will be Biden. Um, but we still have a ways to go and the election's not over yet. So that's where we are. So if you have any questions at this point, obviously just post them in the chat. Otherwise we'll be going on to today's lesson um, and go from there. To be honest, I was hoping that this would be resolved uh, yesterday and then you know even the night before but that's not the case so um, at this point that's where we are all right so if there's no questions which is fine with me let's go on to today's lesson okay so let's look at our first major chief justice we're gonna look at uh, which his name is John Marshall now you're going to look at two chief justices throughout this um, class. John Marshall, okay, and then the other one is going to be um, Earl Warren. And those are the two chief justices you're going to be familiar with. Um, we'll look at John Marshall, why he was significant. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, um, even though he's not the first chief justice, he's the fourth he was one of the longest tenured chief justices. So for those that don't remember, in the chat, how long do Supreme Court justices serve for? Is it four years, eight years? How long do they serve for? They do not for life. Exactly. Excellent. They serve for life. Um, and the reason they serve for life at this point in Syria. <laughs> uh, you know when you sometimes say something close to Syria and then your phone starts bugging out? That was that case. 
Okay, sorry about that. So yeah, they serve for life. So in this case, John Marshall serves for life. Um, you could tell, 34 years, pretty long time. Um, and ultimately, he, the, he is a part of three major Supreme Court cases. Now, one we've already done. One was Marbury versus Madison. Um, and that really you know, established judicial review and gave some more power to the judicial branch. But ultimately, anytime you get a John Marshall question, you've got to identify his name as being a Chief Justice, because sometimes they don't say Chief Justice John Marshall. So anytime you see John Marshall, you've got to say, okay, he's not a president. He's a part of our Supreme Court. He's the Chief Justice. So that means out of the nine Supreme Court justices, he's the leader of the nine. So you have one Chief Justice, eight Associate Justices. He's the leader of the Supreme Court. And pretty much all of his cases, ladies and gentlemen, every single one of note in this class, every single time he was ruling and his court was ruling on decision to increase the power of the federal government. All right. And what does that mean? So our Constitution came in giving, in terms of federalism, the federal government the most power, but really limited it. You're going to see now after some situations and some examples that take place that are going to increase the power of the federal government over the states. Okay. And this is a big role and responsibility that he would do. Now, let's just be straight with you. A Thomas Jefferson, an anti-federalist, a Democratic Republican, would not be the biggest fan of Chief, Chief Justice John Marshall. Okay. However, okay. However, over time, a lot of Democratic Republicans, a lot of former anti-federalists like a Thomas Jefferson started to realize that, yeah, maybe the federal government needs to have a little more power and it's not going to be King George III. Correct. And Thomas Jefferson did appoint Chief Justice John Marshall. So I don't even think he anticipated uh, John Marshall to rule so much in the federal government's favor. But I think when our country was created, we didn't give the federal government, and this is more my opinion, not me being a teacher right now, this is more my opinion. We didn't give the federal government as much power. Therefore, um, some of the things they could do were a little bit limited. All right? And John Marshall is going to be one of the major people that changes that. All right. Going on to our next slide, we are going to go to this. All right. Okay, good thing you guys remembered. Okay, so yes, we are going to open up our Supreme Court graphic organizer. That is from um, that is from your Google Classroom. So again, for those that don't remember, uh, you're going to click on your Google Classroom, all right, and you're going to click on Classwork, and then you're going to scroll down to you see the Supreme Court graphic organizer, and we're going to copy down not one, not just one, but two Supreme Court cases today. Um, very, very exciting stuff. I know you guys can barely contain yourself here at 8.37 here in the morning. All right, so copy down that graphic organizer. Okay, if people don't remember where that is, again, you click on classwork. You scroll down practically nowhere, just a little bit. You should see Supreme Court graphic organizer, and you're going to copy down the two cases down. McCullough versus Maryland is the first in red, and then, yes, you need to copy down Gibbons versus Ogden, as the next one there all right so i'm going to give you about 60 seconds to start it all right i'll mute myself so you can concentrate and then i'll talk about uh each thing no good question you do not have to copy down what's in black because those are just like the setup to the case all we need to know is the outcome
Okay, so let's first start with McCullough versus Maryland. This is the second Supreme Court case you've written down since Marbury versus Madison. And let's see how this particular Supreme Court case under John Marshall proves that the federal government is getting more power. All right. So number one, Maryland is a state. Okay. Let's see how it has an, a problem or a challenge with the federal government. So as we know, at this point, we have a national bank. Not to go into the details of it, it's not important, but Maryland has a problem with the national bank because of some of the tax rates, along with some of the debt that other states have incurred, and Maryland's sick and tired of paying for it, sort of thing. So they were upset at the bank, and what they tried to do, Maryland, was they tried to tax the national bank and try and force the national bank located in Maryland to leave the state. So when you have a national bank, it's not necessarily that there's one bank. They have different branches of the bank. So like Chase Bank, all right? There's a million branches of Chase Bank, all right? The national banks have different branches too. So there's one specifically in Maryland that Maryland's trying to get it to pay taxes, state taxes on. Um, so what ends up happening is Using the elastic clause again, the Supreme Court ruled that states did not have the power to interfere with federal laws and regulations such as the bank. So the federal government wants to have a national bank. Okay, Maryland can't stop that or try and stop that from happening. Okay, if the federal government was to send in the military to a state, and you'll learn this during Reconstruction later on in this class in the 1870s, they send military to the state, Okay, Maryland can't try and throw those people out. If the federal government, because of the supremacy clause, tries to do something, the states need to follow and fall in line. And this was one of those cases where the National Bank became a part of our country. Even if the states don't like it, they need to follow it. Okay, so if there's a federal law, if there is a thing like a National Bank, okay, the states need to follow it. Now, I need to go back and think for a second. Okay, I'm going to write in the chat the Alien and Sedition Acts. Okay, those were federal laws under John Adams. There were two states that came up with resolutions that kind of disregarded and said they're not going to follow these laws. Does anyone remember what those two states were? And came, those two states that came up with res resolutions to um, go against the Alien and Sedition Acts. Okay, Kentucky is one, Virginia is the other. Okay, so they were called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. And that was a time in our country where you were able to nullify or cancel a federal law. After verse McC McCullough versus Maryland, okay, and I'll put this in the chat. So if you want to put this somewhere in the box, you can. If you just want to become familiar with it, that's fine too. Okay. After McCullough versus Maryland, it's harder for states to nullify, cancel, federal laws like they were doing during the Alien Sedition Acts. All right. The National Bank is a part of our federal government. It's essentially set up by a financial plan, which is like a federal law. Therefore, Maryland cannot do this. And the federal government now is strengthened because people have to follow their federal laws and follow their um, federal regulations. All right. So now we'll look at another situation which is called Gibbons versus Ogden. Okay, a big way people traded in the mid, early to mid 1800s was by steamboat. Um, these are boats that, you know, had enough power to uh, get through certain uh, through across the currents and rivers. So a big way people traded between states was um, through steamboat. So the Supreme Court ruled something dealing with interstate commerce. So interstate okay, means between states. Okay, commerce means trade. It's just a really fancy word. 
Uh, the old-fashioned walk on a horse and buggy. All right. But boats have been around for centuries, um, but steamboats are relatively new. So, you know, some very famous moments in world history you learn about in ninth grade, especially when they're fighting wars and one of the sides want to go attack a country, but the wind's blowing in the wrong direction, so they need to wait. Right, there's a very famous, uh, I think it was called the War of Three Kings in Britain, which is some, in England you'll learn about, which is like in 1300s, 1400s. And like one of the sides wants to invade France and they can't because they got to wait for the wind to change. It takes like three months. So steamboats allow you to kind of travel no matter what way the wind is blowing. Okay, so we have this kind of situation. Yeah, it took three months for the wind to change. Um, directions it was going. So we have this situation here where basically New York and New Jersey have an issue. Okay? And what New York was doing was they were basically, you guys know what tolls are, right? Any state that came in, any boat that came in from another country, another country, Jesus, it's early, another state. Okay, so if New Jersey had a boat come through New York State, they had to pay like a toll. And that toll then went to the New York State government. But imagine if you were trading and every time you passed through a state, you had to pay through a toll. Okay, now back in history, okay, this was something that was a little bit tougher to do. Okay, so the Supreme Court ruled that states did not have the power to regulate trade between the states. So if two states are trading with one another, okay, if New York and New Jersey are trading with one another, they are technically crossing state lines. Therefore, it doesn't become a state issue anymore. This becomes a federal government issue. Um, so like, let's just make it simple, okay? Let's say you were a criminal and you owned a gun, okay? And you bought that gun illegally and you take that gun and you now bring it to two or three different states and use that gun in your crime. You are now going to federal court because you're going between states. It's outside the jurisdiction of what a state could do. All right. So anytime there is trade within our country, it now becomes federal government's And states can't regulate trade between other states. That has to be controlled by the federal government. Now, I'm not saying New Yorkers can't trade with new people from New Jersey and Connecticut. I'm not saying that. But it needs to be controlled and overseen by the federal government. Okay, because what happens if there's a problem? Who's going to dispute? And if there's a real serious problem, do you want New Yorkers going to war with New Jersey? That can't happen. So we need to make sure that the federal government is overseeing it and kind of making sure that things are going well. Okay? So Marbury versus Madison, McCullough versus Maryland, Gibbons versus Ogden, all seen under Chief Justice John Marshall. These are all his Supreme Court cases, and there's one common theme. That common theme is going to come up here for some regents' questions as we go up here. All right? So let's start with this one. What was the result of many of the Supreme Court decisions made under Chief Justice John Marshall? Okay, if you remember who he is, it's an easy question. Two. Okay, good. Our federal government was strengthened because of this. Now, which Supreme Court case, be uh, case best completes the partial outline below? So three of these things are all related to one case. So heard under Chief Justice John Marshall, it established judiciary review and strengthened our judiciary or judicial system, judicial system. Which one of these is correct? Excellent. Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison is obviously heard under John Marshall, okay, and also established judiciary review, so we should know that. What was one result of Supreme Court's decision in Gibbons versus Ogden? Please excuse this interruption. This is just a reminder that today is a half day. 
Please follow the schedule provided for periods 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Dismissal is at 11.20 a.m. Thank you. <laughs> correct. You guys are correct. One, okay? Interstate commerce was strengthened. Anytime I see Gibbons versus Ogden, I just think interstate commerce, which is a big term you'll become more familiar with, um, which is trade between the states. Okay, you have the interstate highway system. You'll learn about that. that. Those are highways between the states. Okay, if you guys have ever been on I-95 or I-87, that is interstate. The I stands for interstate. The Supreme Court decisions in Marbury versus Madison, McCullough versus Maryland, and Gibbons versus Ogden, they, they sometimes all get lumped together, okay, is going to give us what correct answer? Good, three, okay. So now what sometimes happens in my class is we have a, um, a one day less, uh, we have one day, but we do two lessons. So we're gonna start lesson two right now. It's very quick, it's gonna take like 15 minutes. This one took like 15, 20 minutes. The next one's gonna take like 15, 20 minutes. So we uh, knock out two lessons in one day. So you have a separate focus question with some separate notes, um, and then it's just one slide of notes, so you'll be okay. All right, so, um, just copy down the focus question here. Okay, so how does the United States try and stay completely isolated from Europe? All right, I'll give you 30 seconds to do so. So write this down. So set up a new page of notes basically if you can. Um, today you won't, tomorrow you will hand in notes though. Same document's fine as long as you have a separate uh, focus question, I don't care. All right, so let's break this down. So how do we stay completely isolated from Europe? Okay, so let's now go into the difference between neutrality and isolationism. And you don't need to write down the isolationism term. It's actually a term we'll talk about more in the 1920s and 30s. Um, after World War I, but just to become familiar with it, um, for my basketball players here, if you were to run an ISO play, it's basically a play where you're on your own. You have no teammates trying to help you, trying to score on your own, not trying to pass the ball, because we want you to do the, uh, do the work. All right, so isolationism is so similar to neutrality, you really don't even need to know the difference, so that's why we're not really writing it down, but when you're isolated, Okay, so I give the fight example, right? If I get into a fight with Mr. Damasi, okay, we know that you could decide to um, defend Mr. Damasi, you could defend Mr. Panio, or you could stay neutral. You're kind of there, but you're not really getting involved. Isolationism is Mr. Panio gets into a fight with Mr. Damasi and you're nowhere to be found. You don't even know the fight happens, basically. Okay, when you're isolated, you're completely apart and away from the affairs of other interests or groups. You don't even care that it's happening. You don't even really know that it's happening. Okay, so America wants to kind of take a step further from George Washington's neutrality, and now they want to become isolated. All right, so if there's any issues with any other countries, um, they really don't want to be involved now, and moreover, they want to isolate themselves. A huge benefit the United States has and why many wars have never come to the United States is because of our geography. What about our geography makes it very tough for other countries to fight against us in a war? I'll leave that open to the chat. Why is it so difficult to fight the United States in a war based off of geography? Genty on Appalachian Mountains is a good guess, but no. Good try. Excellent try. Let me go to this quick. Look at it now. Muhammad, excellent. Okay. Most countries that need to fight us need to cross either the Atlantic Ocean or have to cross the Pacific Ocean. 
We are isolated geograph geographically from most of the world. Now, I know South America is here. I know Canada is here. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm talking about is most of the countries that are up and about, okay, are from Europe, meaning that up and about. Those are the ones that are doing the most things. The other biggest group are from Asia. That's a very far, uh, far way away. So our oceans give us an opportunity to be isolated. Okay, it's very tough for France or Russia or China or Iran to be isolated because they are so close to other countries. So essentially, if we keep Canada and Mexico happy, we're not going to have a war where we have to really fight in our own country. And we kind of see that Britain has come has come twice to try and take over. Okay, and fight against the United States. And it's been miserable for them in the War of 1812 and the Revolutionary War. All right, so it's not easy to do. All right. Um, Abigail, yes, there's more reasons to it, but that is the biggest reason. All right, so make sure I catch up on the chat. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is something that's going to add to our foreign policy. So let me explain a couple things. John Adams followed George Washington's advice on neutrality. Thomas Jefferson did the same thing on neutrality. The next president, James Madison, we get into the War of 1812, but ultimately after that, we become more isolated and neutral, so kind of follows George Washington's policy. So the first four presidents all followed their foreign policy of George Washington's neutrality. James Monroe is going to come in, our fifth president, and change that up a little bit. So please copy down this in red. All right. So the Monroe Doctrine was named by President James Monroe. Now, as the class goes on, when we get into the late 1800s and early 1900s, like every president, okay, through that time era, Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, uh, Franklin Roosevelt eventually, uh, Calvin Coolidge, all of them have different foreign policies, okay? Donald Trump would have a different foreign policy from Barack Obama. And Barack Obama would have a different foreign policy than George Bush, and so on and so forth, okay? But in our country, early on, at least our foreign policies were all kind of the same. Stay, stay out neutral or be isolated. And in this case, we want to be isolated. And here's why. Think of the War of 1812 for a second. Think about the causes. Britain was located in Canada. They had a colony in Canada. So they had people there, and then since they had a colony in Canada, they ended up providing weapons for Native Americans that made our life a lot harder. Okay? So basically what it's saying is, this was James Monroe basically telling Europe only, because the issue was mostly with Europe. He's telling Europe that if they try to colonize lands, that's the first thing. Being in an area already is not what he's talking about. If you go and try and colonize a new land, so if Britain tries to go colonize, let's say, El Salvador, um, what's another example, or Puerto Rico, if they try and colonize a new land, America is going to take that as an act of war. And this is a pretty aggressive statement. Basically letting the rest of the world know that if you quote unquote pass this line in the Western Hemisphere and try and come and take over a country in South America or try and take over a country in North America, we're going to take that as an act of war. All right. The United States will defend that territory. All right. And make sure that that territory is not taken over. In other words, America tells Europe to stay out. All right. Now that is different from, I'll take Cuba. Cuba is located just south of Florida. Cuba is already owned by Spain. So America is not going to say to Spain, you need to leave. But America is saying to Spain, you can't take over any more lands here. All right. Why does America do that? America wants to isolate itself from the rest of the continents like Europe and Asia, because that's going to keep them protected and keep them out of war for a very long time, all right? 
And do you know how many wars we had with other countries, okay, after the Monroe Doctrine? We had none until 1898 with other countries. The only war we get into from 1823 to 1898, okay, is with Mexico in the Mexican-American War. But as you could tell, that is located close to the United States, okay, and the Civil War. All right, no wars with Europe, no wars with Africa, no wars with Asia, no wars with Australia, thanks in large part to the Monroe Doctrine. So we kind of put our foot down and draw a line and say, Europe, you're not allowed to come to the Western Hemisphere anymore. Now, does the United States have the power to do that? It's a little deba debated because we don't run countries in South America. But America knows that if we want to be a stronger country, we need to basically make sure South America is protected. We need to make sure areas of uh, Central America and Latin America are protected. And same thing with Canada. We don't want to have another War of 1812 break out. All right. So again, if you forget foreign policy, it's our relationship with other countries. We are telling the countries of Europe and Asia to stay out and we won't have much of a problem. And this was good because we didn't have any problems with Europe until 1898. All right, where this foreign policy is no longer the same foreign policy. So this was a good thing, okay, even though it was a little gutsy at first to pass, right, because you're kind of like threatening Europe in, in some ways. All right, um, what we'll do now is you have 10 minutes, which is perfect, should be plenty of time to, to do the assignment that I shared. Okay, I just want to remind you, you guys have textbook Thursday due tonight. Um, since it is a half day, you guys should have a little extra time to do some work. So that would be a good thing to do. Um, as per usual, I shared the answer key, but again, I was lazy. I apologize. I did not write the questions down. Okay. So the questions are obviously going to be located on the PDF here. All right. It's a little tough because you're going to actually get, um, well, first off, make sure you read the top part. Uh, the day ends 11.20, so you're going to go to your first four periods, and then you go to your fifth period, but that might be lunch for you, so maybe just your first four periods. But if you do have a fifth period, you'll be there for like 10 or 15 minutes. All right, so make sure you read this first part here, and then you're going to read the actual language from the Monroe Doctrine. We do this sometimes. I know you guys probably hate it, but we have to do this. Then look at the key to help you better understand, Okay what happens after the Monroe Doctrine. Okay, so what happens to a lot of the areas in Latin America and Europe, you'll see a huge difference if you look at the key and the legend. When I mean the key, I mean the legend. Okay, and then answer those. Okay, you have three multiple choice questions. You're gonna put the answers there. Okay, and then you're going to answer questions four and five only. You don't need to do six because you're not in school and I probably wouldn't make you do six anyway because that's not easy to do, all right? So answer those questions, and then if you're done, just let me know, and uh, you'll probably be able to go early.